Welcome to this talk entitled I Compare Partial Edition. My name is Matthias, also known as IAS Reset Me. The following hour or so, we're going to have a look at uh, options for comparing things in PowerShell. And we're going to uh, have a look at how that influences uh, sort order when we sort things. And finally, we're going to have a look at how we can influence some of this behavior using PowerShell classes. So on the agenda for this talk, we're going to review the existing built-in comparison operators in PowerShell, sort of what, uh, what primitives do we have uh, available to be able to, to make comparisons. Uh, we're going to very briefly cover the difference between comparing for equality or equi equivalence uh, versus comparing for ordinality or relational inequality. Uh, obviously, we're going to have a look at how we can order stuff or how we can sort stuff with, with PowerShell. Uh, and we're specifically going to have a, a, a brief uh, recap of what sort object can do. And have a look at what group object can do. And then uh, towards the end, we're going to dig into uh, how we can create comparable classes with PowerShell. Uh, for this purpose, we're going to uh, have a look at a couple of implementations of the iComparable interface and hopefully uh, a brief look at uh, iCompare and iEquality Compare. So, first things first, comparison operators in PowerShell, what, uh, what is available to us out of the box? First of all, we have the dash EQ and dash NE operators, equals and not equals. These test for simple equality. We can figure out whether a number is of the same value of, of another number or the other way around. We also have dash LT and dash GT for less than and uh, greater than operators. And then uh, we have a set of, of non-strict variants of these uh, less than or equal and greater than or equal. On top of that, we have a couple of containment operators for when you have collection types, arrays, uh, innumerable um, case types. Um, if you want to figure out whether a collection contains at least uh, one uh, instance of, of an item, uh, contains or in uh, is the way to go, right? These obviously also have uh, uh, negated counterparts, so not in and not contains. We also have a couple of uh, string operators or string testing operators, the dash like wildcard pattern matching operator and the dash match uh, regex uh, pattern matching operator. And then finally, uh, we have a couple of type operators, the dash is operator to test whether an, an object or an argument is, is of a certain type and it's a negated counterpart is not. Now, why have I arranged these in this sort of weird weird matrix here? Well, there's a reason for that, because these operators all have a different characteristics. Here. And if, if, if we sort of group by uh, some of their, their common characteristics, uh, we might be able to sort of uh, draw up a Venn diagram that looks a little bit like this. Uh, everything in the top two rows, um, all the operators are what we might call overloaded. That is, they depend heavily on the type of the left-hand side argument. And we're going to have a look at what that, that looks like in real life. The ones on the right and in the middle uh, all have sort of a double role. That is, uh, they can perform comparisons, but they can also filter. Finally, we can take uh, this group in here and say that these operators here, less than, greater than, less than or equals, and greater than or equals, really deal with inequality, deal with relational inequality, and this is going to be uh, to be important in, in a second. Finally, we can group these into uh, two distinct categories, strict and, and non-strict inequality operators. The first group uh, is the overloaded operators, and so uh, let's break out the partial and, and see what, the, what we can learn about them. Let's have a, a look at a couple of examples of how uh, this overloaded operator behavior might influence um, the results you're going to get when you apply them. And so let, let's take sort of, sort of the, the obvious uh, trivial example here. 
uh, I have two values, I have two strings with the exact same content. If I apply the EQ operator to that, I would expect it to return true, right? I, I expect these two to be to be considered the same. And sure enough, if we if we execute these, uh, the result is true. But in order for PowerShell to sort of be helpful, right? PowerShell is supposed to be sort of a pit, pit of success tool for people who are not necessarily professional software developers. And so we have a couple of behaviors that allow us to sort of compare apples and oranges. And this is sort of where this overloaded behavior comes in. And so that means that when I say apples and oranges, basically comparing numbers to numbers is not the same as comparing strings to strings. And so in order to compare a number to a string or a string to a number, we need to convert uh, both of them into um, uh, to a type uh, uh, that can be compared, right? So the way to do that, or the way that PowerShell does this, is whenever it sees one of these overloaded operators, uh, less than uh, EQ um, or the containment operators, it's going to have a look at the type of the left-hand side operand. And so if the type of the left-hand side operand, in, in this case, the uh, numerical literal one, PowerShell is going to interpret this as the integer one, right? What it's going to do is it's going to look at the type of the uh, right-hand side uh, argument over here, the string one. It's going to say, ah, these are not of the same type, right? These are apples and oranges. Let me just make sure that this gets converted to something that's comparable to one. So what PowerShell does is it applies, you know, normal PowerShell conversion rules for converting the string one to an end. And sure enough, we get the numerical value one, and therefore the integer one equals the string one, or the string one uh, equals the integer one are always going to return true, right? They're sort of symmetrical by accident in that the string one, when cast as an int, becomes the integer value one, and the other way around, an integer value cast to a string um, is, is going to be the same as the, as the string representation, right? This also works for ordinal comparisons, right? So again, we sort of check for the inequality relationship between two operands. And so we, we might do something like, um, you know, one is, is less than two. Yeah, that, that should be true. Sure enough, partial converts the string two to the integer two and, and this relationship holds, right? Uh, the other way around, we take the string, uh, the string value two, says, is this greater to one? And once again, PowerShell says, this is true. But is this by accident or not? What if we compare the string two to the numerical value 11? Let's see what happens. Apparently in PowerShell, two is greater than 11, except not really. Because what's really happening here is that we're, we're comparing the string value two to the string value 11. PowerShell is silently converting the number 11 to a string that just says one one. And from an alphabetical point of view, yeah, two actually has a greater value than one one, right? If we were to sort these alphabetically, anything starting with the number one would become four, uh, anything starting with the, with the character two. And so, this can sort of bite you, right? So this is this is really this is really important to keep in mind. Most of these operators, these comparison operators in PowerShell, are overloaded, and it depends entirely on the type of the left-hand side argument. What behavior we're going to get from the comparison operator? The most grievous example of this is the uh, sort of true-false dichotomy, and so. I have, an, I have an example here where I'm going to take the, the Boolean value uh, from the, the dollar true variable and I'm going to compare it with the string true. And so if I do this, if I do this, sure enough, it's going to return true, right? True, true equals true. Let's try this the other, the other way around. The string true 
is it false? No, it is not false, right? So, okay, it seems like booleans and strings are symmetrical as well, or are they? If we do false equals the string false, huh, that's really weird. Especially because if I do it the other way around, if I compare the string false, the string rep representation of this boolean value to the actual boolean value false, it says that it's true. And so in this case, we can't we can't rely on some on on any sort of um, uh, asymmetry, uh, or we can't rely on the on the on the symmetric behavior of of the of the EQ operator simply because they are overloaded and depend on the left hand side. So again, these might look equivalent, but they are not. Again, really important to sort of keep in mind when when comparing things in PowerShell. Uh, finally, uh, I think, as you can see here, there's even a PS script analyzer rule specifically for this case where people get uh, a value passed from elsewhere. They try to compare it to null, but if the value that we have over here has been cast to something that can have a null-like or a, 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 a non-truthy value, we're going to have a problem because they're going to try Partial is going to try to convert the null value into the type of this object over here. So again, if object was a string, an empty string, for example, this is going to this is going to be true, simply because casting null to a string is also going to result in, in an empty string. So again, this only works by accident in this case. The real way, instead of doing this, is to say null equals and then the input value because null is the only thing that's null and so either this value is null and you get and you get true uh, because no type conversion will um, will occur uh, partial three and up uh, I'd, I'd, I'd recommend anyone to, to get into the habit of this if if you're sort of getting bitten by this uh, by null checking like this use the use the type operators instead if you expect, you know, an object to, to be some custom data type, then basically, basically test whether the input value is of that type or not, because null doesn't have a type. And so if this has already been cast as an expected type, and it turns out that the value is not actually of that expected type, it means that the value is null, and we can sort of safely skip. So again, stop doing object equals null or null equals object simply just test whether the object is actually an object or not and then make your decisions based on that. Next up, let's have a look at the filter operators. The filter operators, what does this mean? Well, um, as I mentioned before, all of these operators work in something called scale ammo, right? That is, we have a single thing, we have a non-array, a non-collection, a non-enumerable -enum object on the left-hand side of the operand, and then we have some object to describe a criteria we're testing against on the, on the right-hand side. Now, we used um, dash eq and, and the uh, inequality operators in, in the previous example, so I'm going to use the, the string operators match alike in, in the following. But the same behavior will be true uh, for um, for EQ and, and the inequality operators. So okay, let's again look at the simple expected case when applying the mesh operator. I have a um, I have a regular expression uh, pattern here that is just the, the literary characters IIS in my handle IIS reset me right. And so we're just going to ask the regex engine, you know, can this pattern be satisfied uh, uh, using this input string? So I want to execute this, and sure enough, IAS is found right in my IAS recently. So far, so good. But what if I were to pass an array of strings? It doesn't matter how many, right? But an array of strings as the left hand side argument um, to the match operator. So I'm going to do this, right? The only change I've made here is that I've turned this single string into an array containing this single string, right? I'm going to execute that. And I no longer get a Boolean value. What's going on here? Right? Like, is it true or false? I'm, I'm getting confused over here. Well, it turns out that it is true, and that is exactly why it returns the value. So what's happened here is that as soon as we supply an array, since it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense to apply 
you know, a regex match against uh, uh, against an array of things. What's going on here is that PowerShell is going to unravel this entire array, and then against each one of these, it's going to apply this comparison. And so, again, if we look at a, a um, if we look at a collection with um, with a few more examples here using the like operator. Again, if I execute this, I use the like operator to filter. I get all the matching values back, right? I get I get all the values back for which like would otherwise have returned true when executing this condition against it. And so, basically, when we use these or when we use these uh, these filter operators uh, in non-scalar mode or or in list mode, basically we're doing this right. This is this is functionally equivalent of taking the collection, piping it to where object, and then testing against the value of the object itself. Right? And again, down here, the example from before where we used the like operator, the exact same, right? We take an array, we pipe it to where object, and then we have where object execute a predicate that just does like and then the, the pattern against it. The, the nice thing about this is that it is way faster than using where object, right? If if you just let PowerShell handle whatever in the background, PowerShell doesn't need to interpret and compile the script block. It doesn't need to bind values to dollar underscore stuff like that, right? So that means that you can actually get a, a pretty significant performance boost out of relying on on these operators in filtering mode uh, when it's simply the intrinsic value of an object and not a property or anything like that that you're that you're trying to compare against. So this is this is really good keeping in mind, right? The first time, uh, the first time people usually get hit by this is they start doing things with PowerShell, and we have this concept of commandlets that you know return one or more of anything or zero or more of anything, right? And so if you just do get surf, uh, get service, for example, with a disp display name uh, uh, wildcard, uh, we might get multiple service instances back, right? And so. If I try to discover uh, services with with certain with a certain prefix on a machine, right, and I then take the result of that query and I try to apply um, an if condition to it, for example, right, like if these services have an even longer pre prefix, you know, I'm, I'm sort of trying to filter here. This is still going to work down here. I just need to be aware of the fact that service might actually be an array which is something that I might want to check for. And so in, in PowerShell 3.01, uh, we have this synthetic uh, count property and basically every single object uh, to allow us to determine whether the result of, um, of the pipeline was one or more characters. So even though this might not be an array, we're actually going to get count one. So again, worth keeping in mind. The nice thing about this is that this just works as suspected, even though I might be ignorant to the fact that you know get service might have returned more. So again, partial trying to be a, a you know a bit, of, a bit of success runtime sometimes actually interferes with its usefulness a little bit. Uh, so again, it's sort of worth keeping these these rules in mind. Another point of confusion is uh, testing uh, uh, testing for what we might call falsy values, right? Values that when coerced into booleans might actually be interpreted as false rather than true, and so one of the points of, of confusion here is let's 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 take this this array of names right to bias then an empty string, and then uh, Rob, and so if I expected that names might actually only contain a single name, you know I I might do something like oh if if name equals uh, you know an empty string, then I'm just going to skip the entire operation right like I'm going to return out of my function. The problem with with applying this uh, uh, equals empty string to my string array up here is that this expression is going to result in this empty string because it matches the criteria of being an empty string, right? So then, if we put this down here, just going to put some quotes around so we can actually sort of like see that it's an empty string we're talking about here. And sure enough, we can empty string back, right? So the if condition now needs to evaluate this empty string. And as I, as I said before, casting 
an empty value or an empty string value to uh, to the boolean is going to re result in false, right? So that means that yeah, the names array actually contained um, an empty string, right? But we're never going to hit this branch because the fact that there was one out of multiple empty strings uh, inside the names array now mean that the the um, uh, the if condition if value is to false. And so a safer way of doing this is flipping the entire logic around and doing uh, um, uh, less filter for names that are not empty strings. That means we know that we at least have some values, right, that are not empty, right? The other way of doing this, obviously, is to use the contains operator instead because contains uh, contains is not a operator, so we might do something like uh, contains zero. Uh, or an empty string, sure enough, we'd like to return. So, in PowerShell 7 um, and previous versions of PowerShell Core, this is no longer true. Uh, there's, a, there's a bit more going on than what I'm going to describe in the following sort of behind the scenes in sort object. And uh, over the last couple of versions, we've also gotten a, a number of, uh, of new features and, um, and forms optimizations to sort object uh, that gives us things like um, um, sort of pagination, right? We can, we can pick the top 10 out of, out of the collection of, uh, uh, of 100 items according to some sorting criteria. Uh, and for that, we sort of use a, a specialized um, heap sort in, in sort object. But Going back to uh, pre-PowerShell core Windows PowerShell uh, and sort of the, the default fallback behavior of sort object, basically what happens is that once we've collected the uh, input and created our ordering matrix, we're basically just going to pass it off to the array sort method. The array sort method is optimized for sort of general purpose um, uh, ordering uh, of arrays. And so the way this is optimized uh, is using uh, a hybrid algorithm called intro sort, and it's called intro sort because it's sort of dynamic. It can sort of look at its own state and optimize based on that. And so intro sort basically starts by taking the input and performing a um, a number of passes with the quick sort algorithm. The quick sort algorithm uh, is 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 fairly simple. It's a it's a classic divide and conquer algorithm. And what that means is that uh, the algorithm is going to pick, based on an average, uh, a pivoting point uh, that is sort of an expected median uh, of the values in the array. It's going to use that to then partition the input collection. Um, and what we're going to see here when this animation restart is we have a bunch of unordered data, right? And so we find sort of a, a median pivot point, and then we just split the collection into two partitions. We then divide those, split those into smaller partitions, and then sort those individually up until the point where you have sorted subsequences. Each partition is sorted in itself, right? So this is great for sort of small and medium-sized um, uh, sorting, but in order to not get the worst per uh, the worst case performance out of this quick sort implementation, what array sort does is that all of this partitioning going on right here in the animation, you know, dividing and conquering, we're only going to allow that to take place up until a certain depth, at which point we're going to say, okay, enough. If we continue sort of recursively devolving this partitioning of the input, uh, we're, we're going to sort of escalate the, the performance characteristics here. So at some maximum depth, we're going to say enough for the remaining partitions uh, that we have here, uh, we're going to have a look at the partition size itself. So if the partition, uh, if the partitions that we got out of the first pass of quick, quick sort uh, has a size of less than 16, we're going to switch over to insertion sort. Insertion sort is extremely simple. It's also pretty slow, but as long as you only need to sort small arrays that you can basically fit within a memory cache line, Insertion sort is going to be pretty fast simply because of its straightforwardness. And so here again, an animation from, um, from Wikimedia. Insertion sort, pretty simple. We just create sort of a, uh, and built a larger and larger sequence of ascendingly ordered um, values. And at some point we will have rearranged the entire thing. 
If, however, the, uh, the size of the partitions that we have left after performing the initial uh, pass of quick sort are more than 16 uh, items large, we can no longer rely on insertion sort uh, 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 being memory optimized by, uh, by the runtime. And so what we're going to do instead is we're going to switch over to something called heap sort. And heap sort basically builds an in-memory tree in which the um, in which the uh, child node of of uh, of each node in this tree is either smaller than or larger than uh, its parent node, and so this has the really nice property that after doing an initial pass, as we're seeing here, now we have sort of our tree structure, our heap structure, we can start ordering from either maximum or minimum, and so in the case where we want to get the top ten out of a hundred, for example with a custom heap sort implementation, we can actually exit early, right? Once we have the top 10 items in that list, we don't need to worry about the order of everything else if the user doesn't care about it. And so um, in PowerShell 6.1, uh, some, some changes were made so that instead of calling a rate sort, we actually do our own heap sort internally so that we can, um, uh, so that we can return uh, a stable subset uh, of um, of the items that, that are being requested by the user. Okay, now that we've talked about sorting algorithms and you all know that, you know, sort object does sort of like not the worst case uh, uh, performance and, and that we've also made a few optimizations to actually make it really nice. I think we can sort of put this behind us and we don't need to worry about sorting algorithms anymore. So let's go back to sort of the, the meat of, of figuring out how to order this. And so again, Going back, we still have our input. We have our uh, order matrix to which we've applied this descending multiplication. And so now we're simply going to uh, unleash a race sort or our heap sort algorithm on the, uh, on the order matrix down here, swapping the input along with it. And we end up with a collection that looks like this. And as you can see, sure enough, the order matrix is now, um, is now correctly sorted and we get the expected, we get the expected output back. Okay, so that was that was pretty simple, right? Like we took the intrinsic value of the object, we applied, uh, you know, multiplied the uh, minus one, and then we sorted another array using array sort. Okay, what happens when we when we start um, when we start uh, supplying multiple properties or multiple values uh, on which to on which to sort them? because sort object does support multi-level sorting. And so what, what might that look like? So here we have a slightly more interesting example, right? I'm going to ask sort object on the same already sorted input to reorder it first by applying remainder three, that is the remainder after dividing the input value by three, also known as congruence modulo three. And then if we get into a situation where uh, where two of the values happen to translate to the same uh, result for this expression, we're then going to go in and have a look at this second order property, which is just going to be the intrinsic value of, uh, of the input. Uh, so again, in order to create our input, uh, our, our order matrix, we now have to create a two-dimensional array. Right? So in our order matrix, we now have sort of two properties to sort by, right? So we apply these property expressions throughout the, the entire input collection, and we push the result uh, of, of mapping these property expressions onto, onto the input uh, into our order matrix. And so down here, for example, one modulo three is going to give you the result one, two modulo two is, uh, three is going to give you the result two, and so on and so on. And so now we have some differing values in these two, um, in these two rows in our order matrix. And so we start by sorting the, the first level uh, row, the first level expression uh, that we want to sort on. And so the result is going to look like this, right? Once again, by the value of remainder three, we've now sorted uh, the, entire, the entire matrix. If we look at the second order uh, 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 property down here, we see that within the bounds of each of these groups, we are already sorted, right? Because the input value, the input order also happened to be based on the intrinsic sort value of this. But 
what if we do something slightly more advanced? So I'm going to expand the expression up here and say, actually, I want, I want you to order um, this specific property descendingly without affecting the value of the others. And so we can do this with, uh, with a property expression that has a descending key set to true. So if we apply the, the same rule as before, as soon as we see something ordered descendingly, we just apply a uh, multiplication of minus one. And then uh, next, in order to, uh, in order to then uh, keep the order from, uh, from the first row in our ordering matrix, we're going to sort of box these collections, right? Beyond the bounds of any of these boxes, we're not going to be able to swap anything because that will mess up the sort order of uh, the first row. And so we're going to sort of do it within each of these groups. And if we flip that around, we now get the expected result. We get these groups of three based on uh, the remainder uh, of, uh, of dividing by three, but the internal order of each of these sort of subsets are now descending instead. And finally, we get our, our expected output. We already went through a couple of examples of how sort object works and some of the input options you have for deciding um, how, to, how to rank or how to sort the input items. So I'm, I'm not going to go through um, the same examples again. Just briefly list it as we saw before. You can pipe to sort object without any parameter. It'll try to order the items by, by their intrinsic value, their comparable value. Uh, we can specify property names, right? But uh, this is not just a property name. This uh, property parameter will also accept uh, property expressions uh, or calculate expressions, right? So we can pass a script lock to it. It'll try to calculate um, the value of, of that property expression against uh, each of the input values and, and sort by that. And then finally, um, we can actually we can actually pass a uh, hash table containing both an expression and flags um, that might invert the sort order, right? So again, in the case here, uh, specifically uh, specifically saying that we want descending order for this particular expression rather than for the entire upper array. Before we move any further, I, I want to talk a little bit by group object as well, the other way of ordering things, right? When we, when we talk about sorting things or ordering things in real life, actually we're, we're sometimes really just talking about grouping or categorizing things, right? Uh, when people uh, you know, talk about uh, environmentally friendly sorting their, their trash, right? They're actually, we're actually talking about grouping their trash together. Um, and so what does group object look like? Well, group object has almost the exact same uh, sort of user interface as as sort object. That is, we we could take a collection, right? One, two, two, three, three, set it to group object without anything else, and it's going to group them. It's going to partition this input collection based on their intrinsic value, right? So again, executing this, we're going to get a result where we can see that we have two instances of the value one, two instances of the value two, and two instances of the value three. And then each of these, uh, each of these upper elements, these upper records, will also contain a grouping of the exact elements um, that were that were grouped. Um, we can also uh, group um, by the commonality of some or the sameness of some property expression, just like with with sort object, right? Um, so again, like the example in the slides, we're going to take the um, the sequence uh, of integers from uh, one through nine, we're going to group them by the remainder again after dividing by three. And then if we do that, we're going to see that sure enough, it groups them all together. And then the name of each of these, um, these output rows or, or output records is based on the actual value that was, uh, that was calculated, right? Uh, group, uh, group object uh, at least since partial 4.0, as far as I remember, has also has the as hash table switch parameter. And this is going to change the output format slightly. As it indicates, it's going to return a hash table rather than a list of, of, uh, of groups. And this means that we can then sort of index into the, into the output uh, to get easy access to 
uh, a subset of a collection that again shares some some common property. And so again, if we execute this, sure name value. This looks like the hash table output. Um, I'm going to assign this to a variable. So I'm going to try and index into it. There we go. Here again, the index key is going to be the um, the value of the expression by which they're they're grouped, right? And so in this case, I input integers. The key would be the integer value one. Um, Group, group optic also supports um, uh, multi-level grouping, uh, just like sort of sort optic uh, supports uh, having multiple properties and sort of doing doing multi-level sorting. Uh, and for this again, you sort of just you specify multiple conditions, and, and you can specify as many property names or, or conditions as you want. The only caveat here is that the default output, as we saw before. Each record in, in the output from, from group object, the identifier is going to be this name property, and name pro and name is all, always a string. So that means that even if you if if you have properties like this that result in in an integer, the name value in each of these records is going to be a string. And so this this might be problematic if if you're trying to group. Um, uh, if you're trying to group non-string or non-simple value types, uh, because at some point group object is going to have to describe them using a string, so you you might want to you might want to keep up for that. Uh, group object also has this uh, dash no elements, which uh, which can be really useful when you're not really interested in the the uh, the values or the identities of the objects in the input collection themselves but you're only interested in sort of their distribution, right? We want some stats about, you know, if we split and, and partition the input based on, again, some property expressions with criteria, um, how many how many, uh, how many many objects are going to end up in each bin or each partition. And so, again, I'm going to take the output from uh, get service on my machine. It's going to retrieve all the, all, the, uh, all the registered services on this machine. I'm going to group them um, by the startup type property, and I'm going to tell group object that I don't actually care about the input items. I'm not going to use them by anything. I, I just need sort of like statistical output on, on, on the distribution of startup type configurations. So if I do this, sure enough, you can see here that the, um, the, the group property has been cut out. I, I don't have all the service uh, instances in here anymore, but I can clearly see that I have uh, 83 uh, automatically starting services, uh, 198 manual starting services and, and eight services that are disabled. All right, so, okay, so we've, we've sort of looked at some, some vague, maybe not to real life examples. We've, uh, we've sort of talked a little bit about the mechanics of, uh, of specifying which property expressions to sort or group on. But before we, we jump to the uh, class part of this, uh, I just want to show like one real life example uh, that uh, I encountered recently in which uh, sort object and group object uh, was uh, crucial to sort of pivoting some data around. And so the example here is that um, we have some input data from an external system, a software inventory. This could be from SCCM. Uh, it could be from your patch management, uh, patch management suite. It could be from a bunch of network scans. It doesn't really matter, right? Uh, the data that we have here tries to inventorize uh, installed applications on a number of computers. And so for each entry, we have a single application installation, right? We have a single product installed and registered on a specific machine. So the first example here, we can see that on computer one, uh, Visho version 16.0.1.1.9 uh, is installed and the operating system of the computer in question is Windows 10. So for someone like me who works in, in security and detection engineering, uh, this data is really interesting. This data might also be interesting if you're working in, uh, in you know, uh, procurement or license management. Uh, if you want to get, uh, you know, uh, a total a total view of uh, of the, uh, uh, the license software that's installed and how it's distributed throughout your network, right? So the idea here is that we have all of these individual records again from something like a software inventory, and we want to group them together 
by sort of distinct configuration, right? So in the, in the example with the output down here, we could sort of stitch together that we have at least two machines with the exact same configuration. They're both Windows 10, and they have this exact version of Visio, this exact version of Power BI, and this exact version of, of WebEx, right? So this is sort of um, a distinct operating environment that we've seen uh, at least twice throughout the network. Uh, from a security detection uh, engineering point of view, this is interesting if you want to uh, sort of lock down your fleet and make sure that nobody uh, installs anything. If all of a sudden you start seeing a small subset of machines um, that have, you know, uh, unknown or weird versions of software uh, installed, you know, you might want to react on that. Uh, again, if the license, the license requirements for a product change, right, and you need to either upgrade or remove a specific, specific version, this information might also be really useful, right? So, okay, so we have sort of this, this flat array, right? This is basically an, an import CSV, right? So we, we have a set of rows with a couple of properties and can we in some way take this data and manipulate it and sort of pivot it in a way so that we can end up with these groups of distinct computer configurations? And so for that, group object and sort object is going to be extremely valuable. And so the first thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to take all of these records and I'm going to, uh, to use group object to group them by their device name, right? Because if I need to figure out the total configuration of a single machine in order to be able to say whether it's the same configuration as another one, then at least I need to know every single piece of software installed on that specific machine. So if we start by taking this inventory up here, all right, so we have our CSV converted to, converted to structural objects. What I'm going to do here is if I just say inventory and then group them by a device name. Now we can see that we had sort of have five distinct buckets here, each of them describing every single thing attached to that computer, right? every single product installed on that specific computer. So this is a pretty good start. For each of these, I'm going to take the, uh, the group and I'm going to create a new object, a new custom object that describes the configuration of this machine. And so, uh, obviously, it's going to have a name, right? This is just going to be the group name because the device name was what we sort of, you know, what we grouped on in the first place. Then, um, I uh, I'm going to assume that the operating system is going to be the same for every single entry because it's the same computer. So for this reason, I I have a look in uh, into the group of elements that we grouped on. I just take the first example and then I just copy the uh, the operating system value from that. It's going to be true for for uh, um, for all the others, right? Finally, the thing that sort of can tell us whether these computers are configured the same or not is whether they have the exact same set of uh, of software, uh, not just the product names themselves, but the versions themselves as well, and so. To do this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create this software property, which is going to be simply an array of strings describing this product and, uh, and, uh, and the product name, right? So if I do this, I get a couple of, you know, uh, nice, nice objects uh, right here. But in order to be able to, again, group them once more based on their software configuration, I need to make absolutely sure that when I'm comparing these two arrays, that they're sorted. Because if these two arrays are sorted, it happens to be that by accident they actually are right now. But if these two were not sorted right, if this group up here said WebEx, Power BI, and then Visio, if I try to compare these two as strings in order to get the, the appropriate um, sort of uh, identifier for the group, uh, group object, I'm going to get to a point where if we if we look at these as, as sets of software, right, they're going to be the same, but just because this list wasn't sorted correctly, I'm not going to get the correct result. So internally, this array that we're going to use next, we're going to sort that as well. And so by accident, we sort of get almost the exact, uh, the exact same uh, result down here. And then I'm going to take all of this, these groups, right, and then I'm going to push them through a group object one more time, 
And then I'm going to uh, to group on these two expressions right here, the name of the operating system, right, for two computers to be able to, to have the same configuration. They, at, at the very least, must have the same uh, OS. And then since our list of software has now been sorted, calling dash join will always produce the same string, granted that the two arrays, the two software properties contain the same sequence. Finally, we leverage the dash no element uh, parameter switch to say, you know what, we don't actually care about this intermediary computer representation because again, we only want stats for sort of this specific computer configuration. Again, because we're grouping on these two properties, these are going to be uh, concatenated together and will, will become the identifier for each group in the output. And then finally, we simply sort based on the, the counts uh, of each of the output property. Let's, let's try to do this um, without sorting them first. So again, I have my individual uh, device configurations here. Uh, with their software installations sorted internally. I'd like to make these intermediate objects, type into group objects. And as you can see here, the two computers that at, at the top here that had the same operating system and the same list of software have now been grouped into a single one so that I can see that I, I actually only have four distinct configurations across this, this network of five computers. Finally, as I said before, in the desired output, we'd like to group these again if you're doing something like thread hunting or uh, or detection engineering, be, being able to do this sort of stack ranking is you know, it can be really useful. So we pipe the, the output from the final call to group object to sort object. We ask it to sort on the count descendingly, so we get the, the largest values at the top. And then finally, uh, we, uh, we pipe this output to format table, and we should get something that at least looks somewhat like, like what we were hoping for. And sure enough, we get this table down here uh, that has the operating system name, a sorted list of the version uh, products that are installed on this distinct type of configuration, and how many machines uh, match this uh, this fingerprint. So again, sort of nested uh, nested use of, of group object and sort object really useful for taking flat or or sort of minimally structured data uh, and pivoting it into into um, into something that we can then reason about and, and do something useful with. Finally, uh, I want to touch on one thing that sort of trips a lot of people up. What we've been looking at so far uh, for our input here is uh, arrays, right? We had we had an array of, of custom objects from the CSV here. Um, we had an array of integers. Uh, we had an array of, of strings in the previous example with sort object. So these are sort of like simple, uh, simple flat arrays, right? Simple collections. But what if we have something like a hash table or a dictionary, and we would like to ensure that they get sorted, uh, you know, according to some criteria that we can calculate over each of the key value pairs? So as you might know, hash tables are sort of infamous for being unordered, right, or or not having deterministic order. So if we do something like this, hash table, and then as partial to, to show the output, you can see it's all uh, it's all sort of jumbled in here, right? It's no longer in the order we inserted them. It's no longer it's also not in alphabetical order. So what's going on here? The the problem with this is that if we take a hash table and we pipe it to this a hash table like this. One, two, three, and we try and just pipe that through sort of like that's not going to do anything because a hash table is 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 not an array, and so sort of is go, just going to see. Oh, you have an array of one hash table. I don't need to do anything. Right? There's nothing to compare against. So what some people will do is. They will, they will take the hash table and they will say, ah, let me turn this into something enumerable, something that that line can iterate over. And then I'm going to do sort objects against the key, the ABC values. And sure enough, the output we get here 
sort of looks like this is this is a correctly sorted dictionary, right? A correctly sorted um, hash table. But PowerShell is lying to you. What's really happening here is that PowerShell has just formatted an array of individual key value uh, attributes that are no longer part of any hash table, right? This is just a copy of the individual items that we got from the enumerator. So the output of this is no longer a hash table, and this can this can bite you, right? So if you, if you try to do something like this, say like, oh, well, I'm going to override the existing hash table, you're going to have problems because hash table is no longer a hash table. It's an array of key value entries. So how do we get around that? Well, the first thing that comes to mind is that, okay, we we make a copy, right? We, we, we assume we can't do anything about the internal ordering of these keys. So let's make a new a new hash table, let's call this copy, and then using the uh, using get enumerator, we're going to enumerate the key value pairs in the hash table itself. We're going to sort them uh, by key, as we saw before, this works just fine. And then for each key value pair after we've sorted them uh, by their key value, we're going to copy them into our new uh, our new hash table. Say like this. And then we look at the value of copy. Damn it. It's all unsorted again. Well, the reason is that copying a hash table to a new hash table is still going to be a hash table. And as I said before, hash tables are sort of infamous for being completely unordered. So what can we do instead? Well, one thing we can do is we can create an ordered dictionary. If we prefix the uh, hash table literal with this, um, this magical type name ordered, PowerShell is going to create a, a specialized dictionary that maintains insertion order. So what does that mean? It means that the order of the keys in this um, in this new dictionary is going to be determined by when they were inserted, right? So if I start by inserting a equals one, a is always going to be the first uh, key of, of this collection up here. So if we try that instead, there a new copy of the hash table as an ordered dictionary, and then again use the exact same uh, Use the exact same technique, enumerating the key value entries in the hash table, sorting by the key, and then finally copying them uh, into our new order dictionary. It actually retains that insert order. And so, again, if you find yourself in a, in a situation where you want to sort a dictionary, you need to retain the dictionary functionality, you need to still be able to index into it or, or whatever else you might want to do, but you want it to be sorted, well, this is how you do it. Create an ordered dictionary, enumerate the key value pairs of the existing unordered hash table, sort them, and then reinsert, and the ordered dictionary will retain the order by which you, you insert them. So, now that we sort of know how to how to operate the sort object uh, commandlet and the group object commandlets, now that we have an idea of how to use them, the big question becomes: This is all fine for sort of intrinsic uh, or or built-in data types like strings or or integers or whatever you have. Um, but what if we were to define some custom classes, some custom data types in PowerShell? And we wanted those to adhere to a specific default sort order when we pass them to something like um, sort object or array.sort. So the answer to this question, uh, I think I already gave previously when we were talking about three-way comparisons. Uh, in order to sort of implement a, a, a common way of performing these three-way comparisons, we have this interface called system.iComparable. And the system.iComparable interface requires only the implementation of a single method compared to. And so this compared to is this three-way comparison mechanism that we need to implement, which when the current instance is uh, less than or precedes uh, the, um, the argument that we're comparing against in the sort order, we simply spit out a value that's less than zero, usually minus one. 
if the two objects can, can be considered uh, equal in the sort order at least, that is, neither is larger or greater than the other, we just emit zero to indicate that you know we consider them the same in terms of, of, of ordering. And then finally, um, in any case where none of, none of those are true, we simply uh, output a number larger than zero to indicate that the current object is, um, is larger than or follows in the sort order uh, um, relative to the argument that we're comparing against. So, how do we implement I comparable then? Well, we have this we have this method signature here, uh, fairly simple to to convert to PowerShell, right? We don't have public access modifiers in PowerShell. Um, type literals have uh, square brackets around them, and finally, all of our parameters need to be preceded uh, by um, by sigil. So this is basically the um, definition uh, in a PowerShell class. So if we try to implement this in a PowerShell class, I have a really ex simple example here. I have this new text type called some class. I'm specifically saying I want to implement this iComparable interface, or this class should, should implement this iComparable interface. And so I've added uh, a, single, a single property to this class. Uh, this is just going to be sort of a, a simple wrapper class. And so what we're going to do first is I'm just going to hide all of this. So first, we're going to define this this type, this class, without attempting to implement iComparable. Just just this simple base type of the class. And see, it doesn't it doesn't explicitly implement any interface. So if I create a new instance of some class, sure enough. Looks right, it has a value property. Okay, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to create 10 objects with different values in sort of jumping order. So let's take the uh, numbers from 1 to 100 and use that as the basis for our um, for the property value. So for each object, instantiate some class. Following value, and so here I'm going to use to get random ten to just get um, ten out of these first uh, hundred integers in some random order. So now, if we look at these, we can see we have ten. 10 distinct instances of this some class text type. The um, the value of their property are all jumbled right. Like this this is not this is not properly ordered right now. So if I take the instances and I type that to sort uh, sort objects, it does not seem to make a difference. Right? PowerShell does not know how it should apply any sort of sort order to some class, right? PowerShell doesn't know about some class. We literally just defined it, right? We have to tell PowerShell how it needs to behave. So this is where system.iComparable comes in. We declare that we want to implement it. We implement our compare to method. And then this trick is going to be useful for a lot of sort of simple case types. If we just want to sort based on the intrinsic value of some property that already exists on, on this type. It's as simple as simply devolving to comparing the two values against each other, right? We get another object. We take the value property of the current instance, and then we simply just call compare to on that and pass the value property of the other object back in. And so again, assuming that, you know, we can assume that value is an integer on either side, and assuming that, you know, compared to is correctly implemented for integers, which we've seen before, we can sort numbers, right? Then this call right here should tell us either minus one, zero, or one, based on whether the current one is 
precedes, follows, or is equal to uh, the other one in the sort order. So I write this definition of some class, and we do the exact same thing again. We created a bunch of new instances. So look, sure enough, random numbers all all jumbled together, not really sorted properly. Now, if I type to sort object, all of a sudden, magically, these objects get sorted by the value of this property that we've uh, that we're comparing against, and we compare to nothing. This is all you need in order to create partial classes that you can sort that are comparable, right? Implement the iComparable interface by implementing this compare to method. And then again, in the simple case where you just want to wrap the, the, uh, the value of a property already existing on, on this data type, simply just offload it to that, that instance. All right, now that we know how to implement iComparable with the vague examples from before, let's try something that comes a little closer to real life. And out in the real world, I really enjoy pizza. Pizza is awesome, and pizzas are different, right? Uh, one pizza is not necessarily as valuable or as worthy as the other. And so I, I, I thought it might be an interesting idea to try to rank some pizzas uh, using iComparable. And so that's what we're going to do now. I have this class definition here for a pizza that, again, declares an, an implementation of the iComparable interface. The pizza itself has uh, only two properties, the size, the diameter of the pizza, and a list of toppings, a list of strings. And just like in the other examples, we need to implement the compare to method, returns an integer, takes a, uh, an object, and, uh, and we're then going to try to compare the two. Just like before, type checking first off, if the other value is null or null-like, then it should proceed uh, anything else in this whole order. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to compare the pizzas by size. Obviously, more pizza, better, you know. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to do the comparison between the two size properties. Again, we're just comparing an integer to an integer here. But instead of returning the result of that, and then sort of letting that be a proxy for the comparability of, 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 of pizza, we're going to save the result of this because now we have some decisions to make. Namely, if the size comparison resulted in a non-zero value, that is either minus one or plus one, then it means that the sizes are different, right? Either this pizza is bigger than the other one or it's smaller than the other one. If that's the case, then we'll just return that, right? At the very first step, we're simply just going to sort by, by size. But now, in the case where size comparison uh, might have actually returned zero, indicating that the size of the two pieces are the same, what are we going to do then? Well, what I've, what I've done down here is, um, I don't know how you feel about pineapple on pizza, but there should be less of it, very simple. So we're going to count basically how many occurrences of pineapple there is in the toppings list on each pizza using the dash like operator again in filtering mode. And then we're simply going to just count the instances of pineapple that we found in the toppings list. We're going to do that for the current instance, the, the current pizza, and we're going to do it for the other one that, that we're comparing against. Then finally down here, as I said, I want, uh, I want less pineapple, not more. So again, we need to multiply by minus one to make sure that the last thing in the sort order is the thing with the fewest pineapples. One might also be tempted to do something like just flipping the entire thing around. So saying that the, um, the number of pineapples on the other pizza compare to the number of pineapples on this pizza. You could do this and it would have the exact same effect. I tend to not do that because it becomes sort of confusing. It's way easier to see, I can flip it back, it's way easier to see that I deliberately intended to reverse the order 
of this entire thing. Otherwise, I wouldn't have put a minus one in front here. All right. So let's try this out. I'm going to mark off this. Now that our type has been defined, let's check. Freedom of pizza. Let's do a 16 square pizza with some cheese and some tomato. Very simple. So this is going to be pizza number one. And then we're going to create another 16 inch pizza, but this time we're going to put a bunch of pineapple on it. Now that we've implemented uh, iComparable, you'll all of a sudden find that we can actually qualify the relationship between these two pizzas using the less than and uh, greater than operators. So already now we sort of established that there's a there's a there's a sortable relationship between these pizzas, right? Sure enough, if we do p1, p2, Python to sort object, the lowest values valued pizza, the one with pineapple on it, is going to be at the top here. And again, if we want to show that um, or anything else, it's the size that matters. We're going to recreate these these two pizzas. So p1 it's going to be a small one. So now if we do it again, all of a sudden the one with cheese and tomato is on top because it is now a smaller pizza. The size of it is less than the otherwise hard pineapple pizza. One more thing I just want to show here is that um, if you have a property of an integral type, uh, that is an integer or a byte or a short or, or long, um, what you can do is you can actually supplant that with an enum value and your comparisons are going to work just fine. What do we mean by that? Well, uh, in this case right here, where our constructor again takes the size of the pizza as an integer, right? Integers could be negative. So we could come into a situation where someone you know, hacks our, our pizza ordering systems and, and they order pizza, which is minus five inches in diameter. And, I don't know, top with you know shoelaces, and you know we're not going to be able to make a negative diameter pizza, and I don't think we have any shoelaces that are fit for human consumption around. So this is sort of this is pretty bad, right? What you can do in this situation instead is that if you have a sort of a preset set of of sizes, um, obviously you can apply the uh, the range validation um, attribute here. So we could say validate range. Uh, between 12 and uh, 20 uh, inches, for example. But in a case where you have sort of a, um, a set sort of options, uh, you might want to use an enum instead. So we could do something like um, a pizza size here. Um, and so I could say that we only do a small, which has which corresponds to a pizza with a diameter of 10 inches. We have a, a medium pizza, which is we have a large pizza, 18 inches, and then finally we sort of have the XXL, or our problem is called a family pizza, 24 inches right there. Now that we have this uh, enum type, and again, given that the underlying value of all these enum values are integers, we can sort of use them in the exact same way. That is, if integer is I comparable, then you bet that an enum, where the base type is an integer, is also I comparable. And so now we can sort of just plop in our new uh, enum type here. Now people will be prevented from, you know, we don't need the validate rate range attribute anymore because we already have these four valid values, right? And now nobody can, can come in and do, you know, um, pizza new, you know, negative diameter or the thousand inch pizza or whatever, because none of this can be converted to a meaningful uh, pizza size uh, value. So this is going to fail uh, way before we even we even reach the constructor rate. So this is pretty nice. But as I said, the, the, sort of the real nice thing here is that the enum itself also implements compared to. So this is still going to work just the same 
uh, this dot size, even though it's no longer an integer, it's now an enum type with a base type integer, still implements compared to, and we can still um, move on with the same thing. So if you find yourself in a situation where you're using enums to, to sort of uh, use preset, uh, preset data type values, um, this is not a problem. Uh, you can you can you can use uh, their i um, uh, i comparable interface as well. So we've had a look at how to uh, implement um, uh, intrinsic sorting behavior, right? Default sort orders for our own data types with the pizza class that we just looked at before. Um, but sometimes you might be in a situation where you need to sort something and you might need to sort it according to multiple sets of rules and it's not necessarily, um, it does not necessarily make sense to sort of say that this is the default sort order, right? You might have a very specific use case in mind where you need to sort some objects of some type. You might not even have access to the, the, the source code, the, 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 the type definition, right? And so how do you handle that? Well, it turns out that um, there's also sort of an uh, an extrinsic facility for doing these three-way comparisons. And so for this, we have the generic iComparer interface. And so iComparer looks a lot like iComparable. The only difference being that instead of comparing the current instance to one argument that's being passed in, we simply just need this, this external comparer to evaluate two arguments that are being passed in. Otherwise, the rules are the exact same if x is, uh, is less than or, or precedes uh, y in the, in the sort order, uh, again, we return, we return less than zero and so on and so forth. So let's try this. So down here, I, I have again, super simple data type, uh, a shoe. A shoe has a size, right? Maybe we could also give them a, a make and a color. It, it does not really matter, right? What we're interested in, in here is how can we sort on some, on some properties of this shoe? And let's say that I'm not interested in implementing uh, I comparable for this shoe type, or maybe I didn't even author this, this shoe type, right? Maybe this came from an external assembly. And so if I want to do something like, um, let's say create a, a generic list of shoes, I create a list of shoes, going to add some shoes. We're going to have the size 42 shoe. We're going to have a really big size 52 shoe. And then we're going to have a cute little size 38. So now I have this list of shoes here, and as we expect, it sort of retains insertion order, right? So the order in which I insert these, these are still, still the uh, the order they retain in the list, which is exactly what we what we would expect. Just like uh, just like arrays can be sorted uh, in place, so can lists. And for lists, it's pretty simple. You take the instance of the list, uh, and then you simply call the sort method on that. So if we do that now, ah. Something happened. Method invocation exception. Exception calling sort with zero arguments failed to compare two elements in the array. So, because we did not care to implement i comparable, and there's no there's no other way for um, for list but sort to infer the rules for comparing you know one shoe to another. Obviously, sort can't succeed. So, how do we how do we solve that? Well, if you have a look at the, uh, the method signature here. The, the very first or the second overload down here takes one of these I compare over shoe interfaces. So let's try and implement one of those. So I'm going to say the, uh, we're going to do the reverse shoe compare. That is, we're going to rank the shoes um, from uh, always the largest size to the smallest size instead of the other way around. As I said, the interface uh, here is it's almost the exact same as iComparable, but now the method name is compare instead. Uh, compare. 
uh, and we're interested in this one, shoes. So, shoe X and shoe Y. Just like the example before, since we're um, since we're uh, comparing on on sort of an uh, an inherent uh, comparable property value in here, the size, which is an integer, it's easy enough just to return x shoe uh, size compared to size of y. And then again, as I said before, we could have flipped this around. I really like to just explicitly change the sign of, uh, of the thing. And then finally, just need to qualify the second one here. This is the recommendation generic. There we go. So now I'm going to, I already have my shoe type defined. And so now I'm going to define this compare that operates on shoes. So. And run this code. So now we need to pass an instance of this to the list sort method. So let's create one here. This shoe to create a new instance of that. And now when we attempt to sort our shoes with this external compare provided, it can indeed sort itself from the largest shoe size down to the smallest. And so again, you find yourself in a situation where it either does not make sense to create a default sort order, it usually does, but if you find yourself in a situation where that does not make any sense, or the data type uh, that you cannot extend the data type that you're operating on, then uh, this, is a, this is a nice way to go about this. If you find yourself in a situation where you want to sort of cut blanche copy the behavior of, um, of PowerShell's default uh, comparison. So things like uh, ignoring string, uh, ignoring string casing, uh, having, um, uh, having sort of value conversions uh, between different types. You can also do that. So again, we saw before how EQ is overloaded, right? We could actually expose that through a comparer. So we could say something like class, uh, you know, PS comparer, Again, implement system collections generic. I compare. And so here, let's say that we're doing a string compare instead. What we can do in our compare implementation is Say string x, say string y, and then here we call out to system to management for automation of language primitives. We do the compare, which is the sort of the default partial implementation, and partial is then going to take care of comparing whatever this comparer is going to encounter out in the real world. Obviously, we need to. And there you have it, basically a, a partial compliant or a partial behaving compare that you can then pass off um, to either methods or data types that take uh, that take three-way compares um, for the purposes of sorting or ordering. So in summary, you can achieve a lot with just sort object and group object alone, right? Um, play around with it. Uh, and especially this this idea of you know supply script script block uh, supply property expression uh, play around with the uh, with sort of how far you can take the input uh, in terms of how you want to order. Uh, that being said, if you are uh, sort of taking advantage of the ability to define classes at runtime in PowerShell, I would strongly suggest that you look at implementing I comparable. Um, for the reasons that we've seen before, obviously, if it doesn't make sense to say that, you know, you know, are, are these sortable? Are these orderable? Obviously not. But if you find yourself in a situation where you think I I need a default sort order for this kind of thing, I compare it is definitely what you want to dive into. If, on the other hand, you find yourself using uh, generic collections, 
uh, lists dictionaries. A couple of them are also specialized, right? We could we could create a sorted dictionary or or a sorted set in which um, in which we would also need uh, need to either implement I comparable or um, or pass in an, an I compare implementation uh, for the target type that we're trying to sort or store in those collections. So again. Using classes or extensively using uh, sort of generic case types, you definitely want to dig into I compare and, and I compare. Try some demo code will be up online. As I said at the beginning, my name is Matthias, uh, also known as IS370, and uh, thank you very much for watching.